Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member. Um, my question, Mr. Carlisle, and I, I guess I'll take it into a little bit different uh, direction. You're talking about developing this out in rural communities, correct? Um, I'm very concerned because when you start to look at a lot of military type of activity, military activity are out around a lot of rural communities like uh, NTC, National Training Center, 29 Palms, China Lake, uh, impact areas and this type of thing. My question is what type of testing and uh, what is your implementation plan? What have you done to uh, work with the Department of Defense as far as aircraft, uh, you know, helicopters, fixed wing, uh, laser designating devices, and as well as smart munitions because I think it would be a bad day for small businesses and communities if that uh, spectrum were to uh, somehow interfere with a, uh, you know, a training exercise and all of a sudden a smart munition ends up somewhere where it's not supposed to be. Thank you for your question. Um, we have actually been working with DOD since 2008 to coordinate the use of our spectrum um, and uh, with the uh, OASD NII group uh, within the Pentagon. And um, in terms of uh, the more recent identified issue with GPS receivers, which was really only brought up in September of 2010, um, we have had extensive uh, exchanges with U.S. Space Command about the use of, of GPS within the U.S. military, also with Northern Command. Um, General Shelton's testimony before the House Armed Services Committee a few weeks ago quite accurately outlined the fact that, well, you know, you got to train the way you are going to fight, and so we have to be using the same equipment here as we are using over there. Um, the fact is, is that we know where the training facilities are. We know where the proving grounds are. Today, we operate under a very significant requirement to limit our power near uh, airfields and near navigable waterways. Uh, it limits our power significantly in order to avoid any interference with, uh, with aircraft or, or maritime receivers in our band. You can, uh, multi you, you can extend those operating limits to base stations we might put near military uh, bases in order to avoid that interference because you know where the activity is going on. Um, that is one thing you can do. There are other options. Well, then my question is, have we actually put some of these towers out there and run some, uh, some tests on this with, uh, across the spectrum with different types of aircraft and munitions to, to make sure that uh, we are certified? Um, the U.S. Air Force ran uh, classified testing of military receivers uh, in New Mexico in April of this last year. Those results are classified. Uh, we, our cleared consultants have uh, not seen them, uh, so, but we would assume they have run that testing. Now, they ran it under our old uh, business plan, which was to start closest to GPS, and that is part of the reason there was a need for further testing now, is to make sure that, that, uh, that the lower 10 option works for those. And for the rest of the panel, I guess the question is, when was the first time that you all really heard about uh, this impact or potential interference on the GPS system? Was this, you know, kind of like surprises that we should be just restrained to birthdays? Well, I'm not sure about the uh, about birthdays, Congressman West, but I can tell you that, uh, like a lot of issues that come up in public policy, we had a land development issue next to our airport that we learned about by reading about it in the Washington Business Journal. We learned about this by reading about it in the newspaper. I understand that the, the most recent application to the FCC in th in, uh, over the Thanksgiving weekend last year literally was over the Thanksgiving weekend, and the uh, public notice came out with a 10-day turn over the Thanksgiving holiday, which, having done a lot of business with the federal government, I find pretty speedy. Uh, but our first indication of this was strictly out in, in the uh, public area arena. Same thing here. Uh, we basically first heard about it in the public arena probably around the March or April time frame. Um, and then from there, it was uh, quite simply kind of watching the news to see as this thing progresses. Um, same answer, I'm afraid. It's, it's, it's been less than a year and uh, been trying to, just been trying to keep up with it uh, as, as reports appear in the press. We have more recently been contacted by, by the FAA and by the military to provide receivers for testing. So. So we're beginning to become involved that way, but quite recently. May I say when we first learned of it? I'll be very quick. 
Uh, we first learned of it in September of 2010 when the GPS manufacturers brought it to the attention of the FCC. We have actually been working GPS interference issues with the GPS community since 2002 when we reached an agreement with them to limit our emissions into their band. So we have a cliff on our spectrum. There are filters in our transmitters that stop our signal from leaking into GPS. The issue that was, and there was no problem with that agreement for eight years. There is still no problem with that agreement. All the equipment tested out the way it should. The issue that was raised in September 2010, much to our surprise as well as everybody else's here, was that the GPS receivers look well into our band. Uh, so it doesn't really matter if we are limiting our signal. Uh, if we are operating within our band, within our authorized frequencies, they are looking at it and can be overloaded. So that is when we learned of it, and we have been dealing with it since then, too. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. 